Thank you, ladies. Gonna be great. Gonna be great. Welcome this morning. Welcome back to our study of the book of Leviticus. What we call where all Bible reading plans go to die. All right? And we're just being honest. We're being honest about the fact that when we get to this book and our intention of reading through Scripture, we're good in Genesis and we're good in Exodus, but we get to Leviticus, and it's not a book that many people read because at first glance it seems weird, a weird list of rules, uh, weird rituals that we read about. But we are discovering in this series that the book of Leviticus answers a most important question for us. How? How can a sinful people, which we all are, how can a sinful people ever be close to a holy God? And the answer is we must be holy. We must be holy. Holiness is required. And when our follow-up question is, okay, but how? Well, Leviticus brings the evidence that our God is making a way. And we know that is ultimately answered in Jesus. In Jesus. So, When people heard we were going to teach through the Pentateuch this year, the first five books of the Bible, one of the questions we got was, how in the world are you going to preach through Leviticus? And the answer is, we're going to do the same thing with Leviticus that we do with every other book of the Bible. We point you where? To Jesus, because they're all pointing to him. So, Leviticus opens with some instruction that God is giving about five types of sacrifices, all right? Now, I told you in week one, both the beginning and the end of Leviticus are both about some rituals. The end is is about some festivals. The beginning is about sacrifices. And so, I, I gave just at least a little list so you would know. Here's the five types of sacrifices or offerings, a burnt offering, a grain offering, peace, sin, and guilt offering, five different types. I believe every every one of these offerings that we read about in Leviticus really describes an aspect of what Jesus' ultimate sacrifice accomplishes for us. Today, don't worry, we're not going to look at all five. We're just going to look at the first one. We're just going to look at the burnt offering as an example. And... I want to encourage you to see it. When we tend to think about sacrifices, they're always associated with sin, and that's true. Otherwise, we we could be close to a holy God. It is our sin that separates, therefore sacrifices. But the burnt offering is not just an offering for sin. It is an offering of worship. It's an offering of worship, worship to God, an offering that is pleasing to him. So let's dig in, Leviticus chapter 1, verse 1, here's what it says, the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of the meeting. Now in week one, we talked about this, this book opens with the realization not even Moses can be close to a holy God. He can't be in the tent. God is speaking to him from the tent, but God is calling. How cool is that? He's always been calling. He called to Adam in the very beginning, and even to a sinful people, God is calling. He said, speak to the Israelites and say to them, when anyone among you brings an offering to the Lord, Bring as your offering an animal from either the herd or the flock. Specific instruction, God says. When you bring the offering, you're bringing an animal from the herd or the flock. Now, this is what's always amazing to me. Who blessed the people with herds and flocks? God. 
And you always see throughout all of Scripture any offering that you and I are bringing to him originated where? With him. Right? We give nothing that he has not first blessed us with. Now, here's what we need to talk about before we read the next piece of this chapter. What we're studying here can be difficult for us to relate to. We recognize that the sacrificial system is a part of of the biblical narrative. It's a part of God's story, but at the same time, Relating to Israel's worship like we're reading about in Leviticus is sort of alien to us. First reason is, today, as the church, God's people, when we gather for worship, we are not operating out of specific, unwavering instruction of how, for example, this hour or so together looks. Now, don't misunderstand me, because God's Word is our guide. And so, when we read the the early church, and we see them praying, and we see them singing songs, and we see them preaching and teaching the Word, that is the pattern that we see. And so, that that is absolutely the pattern that we follow. But my point is, although God says, your worship should be orderly, not confusing, He doesn't give us a specific order in the sense of he didn't tell us to sing four songs today. You see what I'm saying? He didn't say you sing a song and then you pray and then you sing a song. we, We are not given that specific of structure. In Leviticus, they are. It is incredibly specific about what each sacrifice should be like. Second reason, this is a little bit hard for us to relate to, is that most of us, and I'm saying most because I realize not all, most of us don't relate that much to the slaughter of animals, much less a system of sacrifice. Now again, I know some people do, but most of us that I'm going to be talking to today, we don't even think about processing our meat for example. We let other people do that for us, and then by the time we get it, it's a fairly clean process compared to what it would have been if you had to do all of that, right? So recently, a child asked my wife, do you eat chicken eggs or store eggs? You see what I'm saying? I'm saying most of us eat store meat. That's kind of how we think about it. And you certainly did not consider this morning bringing an animal to worship that needed to be sacrificed today because it was the instruction that God gave you of how to do it. Now, this is a good time to make sure we're clear on something. The New Testament is not the correction of the Old Testament. It's not. I'm afraid a lot of times we, we study things like we are today and we go, oh, we look at, we look at those people back in Leviticus and like that, that's just, that's the only thing, that, that's the best that they knew how to do back then, but now we know better. And so the New Testament is a correction of the Old Testament. No, it's not. What we're going to read today, they are doing exactly what God told them to do. It's not a correction, but the new covenant, which is the New Testament, the new covenant is the fulfillment of the old fulfilled in Jesus. Augustine had a little quip, a little way of saying this. This is how he said it. The new, referring to the New Testament, is in the old, concealed, The Old Testament 
is in the new revealed. And I like, I like what he's trying to say there. He's saying they operate in tandem, right? They really cannot be separated. Together, this is the story of God, not one correcting the other. So, by the way, do do you know how Moses makes his tea? He brews it. He brews it. You get it? So, here's where I'm going. One of the best places in the New Testament that you can go and read for understanding what God was doing with the sacrificial system in Leviticus is the book of Hebrews. I challenge you to read them together. They are in tandem is my point. They, they, they work together. You, so before we go back to Leviticus 1, I want to show you a little bit of how God does that in his word. So, for example, Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. Incredible verse. This is big. For the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Now, this word atonement is not a word we use in our everyday language. We are going to look at it more in this series. But for today, you can think of the word atonement in terms of meaning covering regarding sin, a covering of sin. What he says here is the life is in the blood, and it's the blood that makes atonement. And if we've been paying attention since we opened the first book of the Bible, reading Genesis, Exodus, now Leviticus, we have seen hints of this coming all along. At the very beginning, Adam and Eve sinned, God made something for them. Do you know what he made for them? He made clothes for them, garments to cover them. Do you know what they were made of? animal skins, which means something what? Died. Something died. Something had to die. We get to the covenant that God makes with Abraham. And there's a part of that covenant where God instructs Abraham to bring animals. And as he brings those animals, they are all cut in two, except the birds. The birds are not cut in two, but all the other animals are cut in two, and they are divided so that there is a path between. Abraham does not walk that path, but God walks the blood path, saying, if I break this covenant, it is literally my life as God. He walks the blood path. We get to Exodus and the 10th plague. An angel of death that passes over all the firstborn, their lives will be taken except for those homes where a lamb is slain. And what? The blood applied. The hints have been there all along, and now we get to Exodus with a very specific sacrificial system. And the book of Hebrews gives an amazing explanation of how those animal sacrifices all along were pointing to Jesus who would shed his blood for us and fulfills what was said in Leviticus. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22 says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Now listen, the point of that is not that blood has some magical property to cleanse. The point is that blood represents life. That's what Leviticus just, we just read in Leviticus. And to shed blood is to enact the curse of death that God said all the way back in Genesis chapter 2, if you sin, you die. The forgiveness of God 
cannot be extended without satisfying the justice of God. Death must occur. Blood must be shed for forgiveness. But Hebrews goes on to make it clear. Hebrews chapter 10, for example, verse 4, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. He's like, that, it, it's impo- the word impossible shows up repetitively in the book of Hebrews. And what was impossible for the sacrificial system to accomplish? It, they could not really forgive our sin, but it did point to the one for whom it was possible, Jesus. So, in verse 10 of this same chapter, Hebrews 10, we, we have been made holy. <laughs> that's, that's what we're after all. Like, how can we be close to a holy God? We have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. And then in verse 14, for by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. No more animal sacrifices, because through Jesus, it is finished. That's why in all the places that today now the church gathers, for example, for worship, y'all, we don't have any altars. We don't have altars. Now, I know sometimes people call it that. And we might would even describe an altar call, or, or we would describe, hey, this, this is the altar. It's not the altar. It's not. Because no more blood needs to be shed. Jesus did that once and for all. He is the final sacrifice. Now, we, the body, the whole church, we have become the altar where our hearts and our lives are offered to him he changed it all so in leviticus you've got a people who are offering what i'm calling temporary sacrifices as a temporary covering so that they might gain temporary access to god's presence but now because of a full and permanent sacrifice that has been made by jesus that we may permanently be in his presence. Now we respond willingly with all of our life offered, our bodies as living sacrifices, not because we're trying to get our God to love us, but because he has declared he loves us. So now, let's go back to Leviticus 1, all right? Leviticus 1, let's pick it up with verse 3. We got some sacrifices here. If the offering is a burnt offering from the herd, that's where we're going to start, you are to offer a male without defect. You must present it at the entrance to the tent of the meeting so that it will be acceptable to the Lord. So a herd, a male. Why a male? They considered a male animal more valuable in that day because a male animal could produce possibly many offspring at the same time, right? So certainly a female can have one, two, whatever it may be, but a male could influence many at once, therefore valuable. And without defect, Does that sound familiar to New Testament language that we hear? When we read about Jesus, he is described, right, as the lamb who is without blemish or spot, as in no sin. Immediately, we're just on verse 3, but immediately we are already picking up on the picture that God is laying down for worship when it comes to our worship of him, he is saying, he, the one who is above all, is worthy of the best that we have. The one who is above all is worthy of the best 
that we have. Verse 4. You are to lay your hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it will be accepted on your behalf to make atonement for you. Now, this, is, this is one of those verses that if you're reading this fast, you might just kind of skip over, but what is this about? The picture is when this animal is being offered, you, you, you put your hand on the head of this animal. One, it, I think it was simply to identify, hey, this is, I'm taking responsibility for this. This is my sacrifice. But the bigger picture is an implication. It is symbolic of a transfer of sin or guilt. This sacrifice is being made. This animal's life is being taken because of sin. My. And so it is symbolic of a transfer. It is a substitutionary sacrifice. Now, it's not the substitutionary sacrifice. That was Jesus, but this is a substitutionary sacrifice. Now, here's what I think is also interesting. This word, it sounds like, like for those of you that don't like to touch anything, right? You, you, it, it sounds like you could just kind of you, you put your hand on the, that's not what the word is. The word, the word is to lean. The word is to rest upon, in a sense, to give some support. It's a word of weight. A weight. You lean upon that animal. Here's why I think it's interesting. I didn't put this on the screen, but you can write it down. Psalm 88, Psalm 88, verse 7. Psalm 88, verse 7. The psalmist says to God, Your wrath lies heavily on me. Same language. Your wrath, God, lies heavily on me. Here's what the psalmist is pointing out My sin is not a light thing. It is weighty. And come on, we know it. Our sin, there is a weight that, 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 is, that is brought with it. Our sin lays heavily on someone. But for those of us who have put our faith in Jesus... What we know from the good news, the gospel, is that at the cross, the Bible declares that our God placed the weight of his wrath. He placed the weight of our guilt, all of it upon his son who died in our place. For those of us here today who have placed our faith in Jesus who saves us, the weight of our sin no longer lays upon us. It was laid upon him. He became that sacrifice. Let's keep reading. Verse 9, or verse 5. You are to slaughter the young bull before the Lord. And then Aaron's sons, the priest, shall bring the blood and splash it against the sides of the altar at the entrance to the tent of the meeting. You are to skin the burnt offering and cut it into pieces. The sons of Aaron, the priests, are to put fire on the altar and arrange the wood on the fire. Then Aaron's sons, the priests, shall arrange the pieces, including the head and the fat, on the wood that is burning on the altar. You are to wash the internal organs and the legs with water, and the priest is to burn all of it on the altar. It is a burnt offering, a food offering, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. Let's just leave that there for a minute. To wash the legs, for example, I mean, if you've got any kind of animal, you know animal legs, eh, right? Not just because of what they're walking through, but you know what I'm talking about, right? Animal legs. And so the washing, it is symbolic here, a washing clean, a 
washing clean, and Aaron's sons have an incredible bloody job. They do. If, if you've ever read, maybe, and, and if you haven't, there are descriptions in the Bible that talk about the priestly garments that they wear, and just the beautiful description of the cloth. And, and Do you realize they put those garments on, and they go to work, and immediately what happens? They are covered in blood. They are splashing blood against the altar. Incredibly graphic picture here. I'm saying even if you grew up in church and went to Sunday school your whole life, you likely didn't get that graphic of a picture of this thing. Our best, our best view at times is to see, right, a butcher at the grocery store, right? He wears, wears his apron behind the glass, right? And those animals, by the time he gets them, They've already been bled. This was a part of specific worship instruction. And as that smoke was rising, we have this symbolic picture of an aroma that is pleasing to our God. So, what we're saying then is, okay, in that day, they, when they messed up, when they, when they sinned, when they did something wrong, if they, would, if they would just bring the sacrifice, then suddenly then God was pleased with them. Well, not exactly. Because there are times that burnt offerings are made and God is still not pleased with them. Let me show you one because we got to get the picture. Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 14, verse 12, although they fast, God says, I will not listen to their cry. Though they offer burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Hmm. And when you read the context, here's what's going on. You've got men who claim to be prophets of God who are not declaring what God says is truth. And then you've got people who are claiming to be people of God who are operating exactly the opposite of the heart of God. They are disobeying God. So in other words, they're going through the ritual of bringing their burnt offering, but what does their life look like? Not like him, not like a heart that's truly repentant. And so we see, even in the Old Testament, come on, this is more than just going through a ritual. This is about your life. It's about your life. And we say, well, okay, well, what might that look like then today for like us, the church? I mean, how, how, that's, that's our struggle with going with Leviticus and knowing what we know. Well, how, 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 does, how does that fit today? What would that look like? Well, how about Hebrews 13? Hebrews 13 reads this way, through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name, and do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. He's pleased. So again, let's be clear. Y'all, we're not talking about us doing what we're doing here because we're trying to get God to love us. But it's because we know through Jesus that he does fully love us. We offer our lives to him, openly professing his name. That, 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 that means more than just singing a song about him when you come to church. It's a life that professes Jesus' life to me. That in every opportunity I get, I am declaring his great name and who he is. And what does that look like in the practical side of life? It, it looks good. It is to do good. It is to share what you have with people, for example, which means my stuff is not where I put my trust. My stuff is not where I find security. My, my stuff is not my God, and therefore I can use even my stuff to bless the lives of other people that they might know of a God who loves them too. And he says, when you make that sacrifice of your lives, God is pleased. 
Because it's not just about a ritual. It's about our life. Let's keep reading. Verse 10. Verse 10. If the offering is a burnt offering from the flock. Now what was the last one from? The herd. This one's from the flock. If the offering is a burnt offering from the flock, from either the sheep or the goats, you are to offer a male without defect. That, that sounds familiar. You are to slaughter it at the north side of the altar before the Lord. And Aaron's sons, the priest, shall splash its blood against the sides of the altar. You are to cut it into pieces, and the priest shall arrange them, including the head and the fat, on the wood that is burning on the altar. You are to wash the internal organs and the legs with water, and the priest is to bring all of them and burn them on the altar. It is a burnt offering, a food offering, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. Okay. We just switched from the herd to the flock, and we we switched from a bull to sheep or goats, but like that whole process sounded the same, right? Washing of legs, splashing of blood. The whole process sounds the same, including God's response to it that he was also pleased, just as he was pleased with the bull, now a goat or a sheep. Let me read one more, and I promise it's for a reason, because I know you love this language today. You love the imagery, right? One more, verse, seven, verse 14, verse 14. If the offering to the Lord is a burnt offering of... Birds, Hmm. you are to offer a dove or a young pigeon. The priest shall bring it to the altar, wring off the head and burn it on the altar. Its blood shall be drained out on the side of the altar. He is to remove the crop and the feathers. That crop's that weird thing in the front. Okay, crop and the feathers and throw them down east of the altar where the ashes are. He shall tear it open by the wings, not dividing it completely. That's interesting, just like with Abraham's covenant, not dividing it completely. And then the priest shall burn it on the wood that is burning on the altar. It is a burnt offering, a food offering, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. So one more, little different because it's a bird in the way that happens, but really the same process of a burnt offering and God's response the same. My question, God, why three? Like, why do we need three different options here? Well, I think it has to do with the wealth of the ones who are bringing the sacrifices. And if we look closely here, we're getting the picture of a God who is making accommodation here for the fact that Perhaps not everyone has a bull or a sheep. By the second century, which the time frame is often called the Second Temple Judaism uh, time frame, um, they would sell like the birds at the temple. Remember the couple of times in Scripture where Jesus goes WWE? Remember, and he, he turns the tables over, and right? Remember that whole deal? What are they doing? They are selling sacrifices for this to be done. Now, he doesn't seem to be upset about the fact that they're selling the sacrifices because now you've got people, they are living in Jerusalem, maybe like some of us would live in a town or a city, and we don't own herds of bulls or, or sheep or whatever. We, we, the way we live is different. Not everybody has that, and so they can go to the temple. They could purchase a bird, for example, and offer the sacrifice. He turns over those tables because they are price gouging. They are taking advantage of the people who are required to make the sacrifices. But why these three options? It's because, again, God is bringing the picture clear. Y'all, this whole thing about worship, this is an issue of the heart. It's the heart. It's what what each could give. God is giving everyone the opportunity to make the best offering that they can make. And he's making it super clear. 
that if a bird is the best offering that you can bring, his heart fully satisfied to the same level as if it were a bull. Because he doesn't need any of those animals. They all belong to him anyway, right? It's about your heart. And the opportunity to bring the best that they can. Knowing that that is always pleasing to him. These offerings were costly for them. In the sense that for most of them, especially in Leviticus day, right? They lived off these animals. And these offerings were a reminder of priority. Because if you try to imagine living in that giant encampment of Israel, as they are moving, right? They've left Egypt and they're headed toward the promised land. And every day you can smell, you can smell the evidence that God is the one who is above all. And his demand is recognized above all in the sense that there were times that, right, something like, well, we know it from like the fatted calf. You would only, they would only do that on a big celebration. It would be something only used for a special occasion. And yet every day the smell of something at that level is happening on that altar declaring the centrality and the superiority of a God who is above all and deserves our best. Our best. If you see Leviticus falling in the Bible right after Exodus, all right, then you understand we just studied Exodus where God delivered them from slavery. In other words, what is the appropriate response to such grace? It is complete devotion. God, I am all yours, the best and all that I have, yours. This talk of meat on a fire is speaking my love language, all right? It's speaking my love language. Um, a week or so ago, uh, the, the four of my family, we got away for a few days, decided to, to uh, head to the beach for just a couple of days, and we got back around Memorial Day, which Memorial Day is kind of that everybody grabbed the grill and, you know, you're firing up something. And Well, because we had just got back, I wanted something good, and I'm cooking for my four and for my mom and dad. And I, w- I want something good, but I don't want to spend all day cooking it. It's just one of those days. Well, when I hear something really good that doesn't take long, my brain says steak. All right? Steak. And so I'm telling you, I went and found the best steak that I could buy. It was not choice. It was prime. All right? which I highly recommend to you when you can get your hands on it. I'm not going to tell you how much I spent on it because you will judge me. Some of you will judge. Um, And I'm not going to get in that battle with you, but I'm just saying it is my preference that when I have the ability to do so, when I have a little extra funds in order to be able to operate, I would choose to get prime. All right? I just would. When I can, I want to bring the best for me and my family to eat in that way. I realized I'm kind of a steak snob. I am. Now I'll eat it. You put it on fire, I'll eat it, but I'm kind of a steak. You have to say it slow or it comes out snake. Steak snob, all right? Because when I'm able to do so, Man, I love to bring the best steaks that I can find and cook them for my family. In that whole process, I also realized I'm a beach snob. I am. I'm a beach snob. We went to the beach. It was really cool. Just a few days. It was a private kind of place in the sense that, I mean, it was a public place, but there was nobody around. Like, there were days I could look both ways on the beach for a mile. There was nobody. 
There's only a few restaurants in that little town. We just kind of enjoyed all that. The waves were cool. The, everything about the, the place we stayed, comfortable, fantastic. But we ain't going back because the water is brown as it can possibly be. And I realized I'm, I'm a beach snob too. I'm a, I'm a steak snob. I'm a beach snob. But here's what I really want to become. I want to be a worship snob. And not like you might think. Because I think there are worship snobs that look like this. They come into a place like this today and they immediately begin to evaluate. How was the singing delivered to me? How did the band do presenting to me? And how did the preacher do in preaching to me and how was the hospitality how was the food and it becomes this evaluation of what we call worship you haven't worshiped yet if you're just evaluating a performance that's been delivered to you your worship is you bringing It's you bringing you, saying, I want to bring the best to my God, meaning all that I am. Yes, knowing I am imperfect. Yes, knowing that I mess up. Yes, knowing all of my failures. Yeah, but my God who loves me, he has extended his grace to me. He has moved me from slavery of sin to freedom in him. And now I want to worship him, bringing the best that I have, not just in an hour when we meet together, but my life. I want to be a worship snob that will not settle for anything less than all to him. Some of you perhaps have always struggled with wondering if your best is truly enough to please God. And my prayer today is that God in his supernatural power could use even a weird little chapter in Leviticus chapter one to start to show you Yes, 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 your best truly is pleasing. But it might be worth asking, I don't know, for some of us to be challenged today in the fact that y'all come on, knowing where we live and knowing what we've been given, there's a lot of us who have been blessed with herds of bulls, and you know I'm speaking figuratively, we have been blessed with herds of bulls. It is time to move past only giving him birds. Come on, not because he will love you more. But come on, do you see who he is? And that your heart's desire might be to truly declare him worthy. Well, let's end this way today. Crazy chapter, right? <laughs> I've had a ton of fun with Leviticus, and it's been fun for people to, it, they, they like come up to me and almost, they, they like, they go ahead and admit it. It's like, I'm kind of excited about Leviticus. I was like, I know, I know. Y'all, you recognize how non-smelly our worship is after you look at something like today? Like, I mean, it's different than birds and livestock being brought in here and and man, they're always doing all kinds of stuff and you, you, you've just got noise and smells and fire and smoke. And this is ours. And it's sort of like, I think sometimes people raise the question, well, is our worship less? Like, because we don't have all that. And there almost, almost at times can be a little bit of, even though you really don't want all that, a little bit of liturgical envy, if you will, of maybe we need some smells and bells to shake things up. You know what I mean? Maybe we need some stuff. And I'm saying, is that really what we need? No. What is it that we do 
in terms when we come to worship that makes God evident, right, among us. It is what is often referred to, and I don't like the term, but I'm going to explain. It's often referred to as the ordinary means of grace. And the thing I don't like is the word ordinary, because ordinary sounds like it's far from supernatural, and that's not true. When we're talking about the ordinary means of grace, we are talking about something very supernatural, absolutely transforming and life-changing. What it, that, that term simply is referring to what are the typical, plain, simple, all-the-time ways that God, what does he use to strengthen us and grow us? Now, I want to be real clear. It does not mean that we should not be creative. Not at all. He created us to be creative, right? And there's a part of that is an offering to him as we are giving our best. But it means the creativity in and of itself is not the means, right? In other words, if we could just be more creative, then maybe we would experience, no, nope. no. Nope. At the center of the ordinary means of God's grace is his word. It is his word that encompasses it all, his word that is alive, his word that transforms. You read the book of Acts and it literally is talking about the word as if it is a person, the word that is increasing, the word is doing this. It is his word that is key for us. Me, this happening today is not just, this is life to us. This is a part of what God uses to strengthen and grow us. And not just here, but as his word is taught, right, throughout the week and in your homes, the word is central. And when we read that word, we see then also the fellowship of God's people becomes an ordinary means of his grace. Sometimes you think that whether you choose to meet with God's people on a regular basis is just kind of one of those optional things that depends on how busy you are or not. No, I'm telling you, it is a critical part of the design that God has put in place to strengthen and grow you. It is the fellowship of his people. And a part of what we do when we fellowship is like today we sing. That is a, an ordinary means as we sing together and as we pray together and as we pray for one another. And sometimes we will celebrate a baptism or we will celebrate the Lord's Supper. And even on the days that those things perhaps we, we don't actually do, the language is embedded every single week just like it was today. Those are the ordinary means of God's grace that he is always at work in. You don't have to wonder. He is working to grow us and to strengthen us. If you are frustrated or in some way feel like perhaps those ordinary means of grace are inadequate, I'm trying to say this as gently as possible you may not have really come to know Jesus. But it could be possible that you know who he is, but have settled for rituals to him. And I'm saying that sometimes, even today, there are churchy people who pray, and they sing, and they read, but those things are like rituals because they don't really know Jesus. And y'all, I don't care how good the rituals are, without Jesus, they will always be empty. They will be empty. So today, man, I want to invite you that if never before, your life makes the move from going to church, doing church things, to knowing the Jesus who can make you his church, forgiven, adopted, and loved. Him being with you 
forever. Now with us by his spirit, one day we go to be with him with you forever. I'm going to pray for us and then we're going to sing. But when I pray, I want to invite you to just do something physically. um, To just maybe help us just a little bit process some of what we've heard today and what I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to invite you, when I'm praying for you, to lean. So in a minute, I'll have you stand in a minute, and if you're at a table, you could use that table. If you're at a chair, you can, you can use the chair in front of you. This doesn't have to be super weird. I'm given permission for all of us to be able to do this so that you don't feel weird if you choose to do it. But I want to encourage you to lean. Just put a little bit of weight on that chair or that table beside you. And I want you to be reminded, your sin lays heavy on someone. If you have given your life to Jesus, then your sin no longer weighs heavy on you. It weighs heavy on him, and I want to invite you in that moment of, leave, of, of leaning to just from your heart to thank him again and to praise him again. What we are reminded of today is a freedom that he has given you from sin. But if while you are leaning, you cannot say that's the case, and you know that that weight still lays heavy on you, then I want to invite you in these next moments to turn to Jesus. To turn to Jesus. Not magic words, but a heart that calls out to him. It says, Jesus, I need you. I am a sinner. And I feel the separation, but I believe that you died for my sin and that you rose from the dead and I'm asking you Jesus to forgive me and I am placing all of my life on the altar I'm yours I invite you to do that let's stand let's stand I'm going to pray for us if you need if you need further conversation, questions, somebody you'd love to talk to, um, there's going to be some folks right over here by the cross. Feel free. While we're singing, afterwards, whatever, they will be there. We'll be honored to talk and to pray for you. Let me pray for us, and we'll sing. All right? Lord, we are thankful for the power of your spirit today. Because it's only by you that we understand spiritual things. And we're certainly not going to understand what we've studied today, the first chapter of Leviticus, sacrificial system. But God, you have brought that together for us. And I thank you for the things that you've shown us today. I thank you for the, the, the calling upon our life, recognizing you are worth it all. And so today, God, I pray for your kids, your kids who could just be reminded that they are forgiven, they are free, and that you would give them faith, faith to be worship snobs, that they will not settle for less than all of them. God, would you give us faith to follow? Now, I pray for those who today need to put their trust in you for the first time. Will you give them eyes to see? Will you give them faith to believe? And as they turn to you, they might know life. As we lean, we are grateful. We are grateful for the greatest gift in your son, Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray together. All God's people said, amen.